You got into it, I suppose, answering something like this. No, I couldn't find a uh, poster for the uh, uh, local uh, Minnesota recruiters. Uh, this one is for the uh, company called the Indiana Snake Killers, and it's part of Colonel Scribner's regiment. Down at the bottom right, it's a little blurred, but the people at the are the captain and the two lieutenants. And the way this would work is not that you have a draft or you have a recruiting office, uh, you would have somebody like Captain Sexton there who would get a commission from the governor to go out and raise a uh, militia company. And he'd go out and make a speech in the back of a wagon someplace and uh, go around to all the uh, town halls and all the village greens and see if he could talk into joining up. Uh, paid fairly well actually for, for the times, which was a uh, recessionary period. Uh, captain would get $115 in change a month, which amounts to about, what, $1,400 a year, $1,300? Uh, as uh, one of the people who signed up uh, as a captain noted, uh, the, who was a lawyer, he said the lawyers around here are barely making their board these days. Uh, there was very little money to be had in the state of Minnesota. So this was not, not a bad deal, not a bad deal in a lot of places. Uh, of course, when you joined up... That the Indiana Snake Killers? Yeah, the Indiana Snake Killers. Okay. Uh, when you joined up, you'd be a little bit green. Uh, there's a few of them. They haven't, don't trust them with anything that actually shoots so far. We've got them with a stick. And they're all lined up with their top hats, their slouch hats, overalls, all the volunteers. And uh, this is something that uh, I imagine came as somewhat of a shock to a lot of people to find out what the Army was like. Very few people that I'm aware of that signed up from the Washington County had actually been in the Army before. Previous war we had was the Mexican War that ended in 1848. Most of these are younger men who of course had no opportunity to be in that. However, we had a colonel. A colonel who was in the Mexican War and had something of a record. That's the guy on the right. That's uh, Colonel Willis Gorman. Uh, Willis had been appointed governor of Minnesota by Franklin Pierce based on his uh, work with Franklin Pierce in the Civil War and of course he campaigned quite a bit for Franklin Pierce too. A well-known politician and I suppose the way he was described by a lot of people was um, big mouth blowhard liar some of the nicer things that they said about him. But you look at him, he has that uh, little book, a bit of a look of the, uh, the Southern Colonel about him, as distinguished from a lot of the other colonels and generals in the Civil War who really had a magnificent beard down to about here. But uh, the Colonel was a little different. He was uh, outside, but I'd say to being a big mouth blowhard, uh, big Mouth is one word. It was said that uh, by a Maine regiment that was stationed about a mile away from the 1st Minnesota, Colonel Gorman, Colonel, they could very clearly hear what Colonel Gorman was saying to his troops and isolate all the cuss words too, which apparently the Colonel was quite adept at and had a uh, remarkable stock. Uh, he was a hard grill master. He was not the sort of fellow that was a buddy with the men. If they were going to some uncomfortable place and camping out in the cold and the wet, uh, you would expect that the colonel would keep his tent with them to show the boys that he was on their side. The colonel would usually go off and find a house someplace in the feather bed. He was not loved, but apparently he was 
had some talent for grilling the men. And he could take a bunch like uh, you just saw there, with no experience, and turn them into what uh, one of the later colonels called the best grilled regiment in the army. That's in the Army of the Potomac. And the best fighters. Uh, I suppose they uh, just, uh, if they are going to meet the enemy, they just somehow saw Colonel Gorman in front of them, and just incited them to sharpen their bayonets, charge. Uh, that's what you'd get after a uh, while grilling. That's the way you'd look on the parade ground, and that's actually the way you'd go out in the field. Just like that. Line up so your elbows are touching. Back off a little. About so much between the ranks. Captain in the front, sergeant on the end. That's the uh, lieutenants with the sword. And uh, they would function a little bit differently, and we'll show that a little later as to what happens uh, in a state of war. The uh, colonel would uh, beat them into this kind of shape uh, when the uh, first went down to Washington uh, by grilling about four hours a day. Then you'd have target practice and you'd police the area. And then you'd start over the next day, police the area and target practice, and then you'd grill. And you'd change around and do the same thing the next day right through Saturday when you'd uh, go into Sunday and have dress parade. The uh, reason you do this is not so you can show off on the parade ground. It's actually because you are dealing with a muzzle-loading rifle. And uh, they said in uh, the manual and that's a little book, it's about like so. And every officer had one in his back pocket right here. And you're supposed to be able to get off three rounds, it says, in a minute. And I talked to Ken back there about that, and he said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> now, people have tried it after a lot of practice uh, without anybody shooting at him, and no, you can't do it. Uh, in a letter, our boys in the first regiment said they could do it two rounds in a minute. I think uh, Ken thinks maybe that three rounds means you're all loaded and ready to go, and that's one, and then you can get off another two. But you're not going to be able to uh, get behind something and uh, fire away with your machine gun. You're uh, fighting pretty much standing up it's a little hard to reload your uh, rifle muzzle loader if you're lying on your back. If you just hit the dirt, think about it. Uh, and to get that shot off, what you have to do is you've got a paper cartridge. That is, it's a tube of paper. It's got your bullet in one end, the ball, and the powder in the other. So there you are, bite the end of the cartridge off, pour the, pour the powder into, the, into your rifle, about like so is where it's going to be. Then set the uh, ball up on the barrel, get your ramrod, like so, knock it home, okay, then you're about ready. Remember to put the ramrod back, take it out and put it back. Uh, some people would get a little flustered at this point and uh, fire with the ramrod still in there, which made it rather difficult to make the second shot. <laughs> but uh, now try to visualize doing this if you're on the ground ducking some fire. It's hard to do. So the way that, uh, and you try to have the front line fire around the background, fire in between of the next round, so you've got pretty much a continuous fire, is your hope.
And that's how you got to the battlefield where you could fire off your rounds. That's a Union soldier in what we call heavy marching order. And Ken will correct me if I go wrong. Shoes. We have some people who commented they bought a nice set of boots to uh, go to war in. And they discovered that when you went through the creek, you got your boots full of water and you're a little slow getting dried off, which is kind of hard on your feet after a while. So fancy boots, no. And you'll notice up there, the spare shoes. Now going up, that's the canteen. And you've seen the regular Boy Scout canteen? That's about the same thing. This was, you know, if you happen to be uh, lying wounded on the battlefield and some Confederate came up to go through your stuff, that'd be one of the first things you'd grab. See, the Confederates didn't have the machinery that could make that... Bullseye. Yeah, could make that disc and press it out. So they had wooden canteens which tended to leak, or else they were sealed with tar, I suppose, which made them uh, impeded, or was a detriment to the taste of the water. And the canteen was a great thing to get. And there's a can back there. That's a very necessary part of the whole equipment. It's what you make your coffee in. And every time there's a little break, on the march, somebody would get off and find some wood someplace to start the fire, heat some water, make some coffee. If you had to leave early before the coffee was done and drank, it would be certainly some points against your commanding officer. A lot of grumbling there. And that, of course, is the backpack or the knapsack. Up the top of it, that's the blanket roll, which is your blanket, uh, a rubber blanket, uh, in case you're camping out on the wet ground, and half of a tent, shelter half. Anybody remember the pup tents? Same difference. We'll see some later. And there on the back of that, there's the kitchen. That's the frying pan. And this would probably be the uh, one, uh, one of a group of four would have the frying pan. You know, everybody wouldn't have it, but uh, you'd have a group that would uh, mess together, maybe even, and two, two of course would have a tent together because you just had half of the tent. So there are bound to be two of you in the tent. And that's about it. Here's some of the things you can't see. That's the haversack. That's on the other side. This is, I think, a homemade one. Uh, it's from uh, an auction catalog. It's supposed to be authentic of the period. But uh, that's where you keep your coffee and your pork, your rations. Uh, any other little thing, uh, your coffee are kept in that, and anything else you want to put in a haversack. Uh, makes a bit of a mess, I think, as far as the, uh, as far as being a staircase for your food. That's the other essential piece. Now that's the knapsack. And there's the two straps that'll hold it on like this. The straps on the other side are the ones you see holding down the frying pan. And then there's your blanket roll on top. A lot of times if you were maybe going out, especially the southerners, going out as skirmishers, that is in advance, uh, you might just uh, take nothing but the blanket roll. You'd roll it up the long way, sling it over here like that.
And there's a cartridge box. That's over on the other side too. There are a couple kinds. There's ones that have tin boxes inside. This one has slots for the cartridges. And again, as I mentioned, those are paper cartridges. Of course, if you're lucky enough to have a Henry rifle, presumably you would put your 16 rounds extra. The Henry would take 16 in the uh, in the weapon. And uh, that would, of course, save you the trouble of having to do this business with the ramrod and whatnot. But the uh, Union Ordnance people, the people that uh, supplied the troops with the weapons, never quite see that. You know, you give somebody that's going to hold 16 rounds, well, just waste ammunition. <laughs> really. So if you make them take their time with it, you know, then you're, you'll save on ammunition and it'll be a wonderful thing. Um, I don't know if that, any of that thinking is still around in the Army or not. I don't think so. <coughs> the, uh, they did have sharpshooters, by the way, who had, were assigned a uh, cartridge rifle or the sharps rifle. Uh, the sharps actually used a paper cartridge, but there was a mechanism to uh, actually cut the cartridge open in single shot. And the Company L of the 1st Minnesota was a group of sharpshooters. They had sharps rifles and supposedly quite a good shooting rifle, uh, a favorite of the buffalo hunters out west. That's apportioning your coffee and sugar. The uh, coffee and sugar about in the 1840s, I think, replaced the whiskey ration. And before that, it'd be something like three fingers in the water glass after breakfast, and another bump in the afternoon to keep you going. Uh, somebody, uh, some old maids decided that you know, this was probably not healthy, and what you ought to have is some nice coffee and sugar, but not too much. Probably overstimulate you. And this was usually kept more or less loose in the haversack with everything else, which makes for a little bit gritty coffee, but uh, that's the way. You have to put up with something when you're carrying everything on your back. Uh, at the uh, beginning of the war, there was a little bit more transport that went with you, but uh, when you got into it, they got rid of the round tents, the Sibley tents, which would have to travel in a wagon, and they'd take maybe 15 to 20 men would be in the tent, all arranged with your feet towards the center. And then when it want to roll over, then everybody rolls over in unison according to the drill. But uh, that was getting so it would actually take up too much space and too much transport. So after a while, they cut it back and put everything they could on the backs of the uh, infantry. There is a soldier doing something with the most common article of food, hardtack. And they come in big boxes, and those wagons would be half full of them. And it's uh, about so, and it's about so, and it's sort of a bread-like substance, but it is very, very hard. The, uh, there was a joke about it that ran around in the, uh, in the camps in the old days. Uh, there is the sergeant with his hardtack and the new recruit over here. And the sergeant picks up his hardtack, <clears throat> takes a bite and he says, something soft in there. And the recruit says, oh, is it a worm? The sergeant said, no, ten penny nail. <laughs> You take a little grease, 
and fry it up in there and get it a little bit more edible. Uh, the other thing, and Adam Marty, I believe, talks about doing that, was you just break it up with the butt of your uh, rifle in dust, and then you can fry it again with the, uh, the uh, grease from your uh, preserved pork. And over here, of course, you see the haversack and candy again. And again over there, there's the coffee on the edge of the fire. Camp cuisine. <laughs> of course, there's a little variety that you would uh, find in a couple of the Minnesota regiments were pretty good at uh, grocery shopping. Uh, it was uh, Colonel Gorman said that uh, the first are amazing. They steal more and get caught less than anybody else in the army. And uh, there were a lot of chickens and sheep that disappeared from the region where the, uh, the first was. <coughs> Some of the regiments of Sherman's, of course, turned this into an art. The uh, squad would go out, a few men would go out in the morning and march out and disappear over the hill. They'd be gone all day. And along about uh, early in the afternoon, they'd come back with a wagon, a team of good mules, and the wagon all full of produce. And nobody asked them how this might have occurred, because it was officially poor policy to plunder the uh, uh, locals. But as, uh, as one soldier explained it, he said, well, they shouldn't miss a few chickens. If they was Rebs, why, it would serve them right. And if they were Union, well, then they should be happy to help out their boys. Either way, the chickens were going to disappear. That's the supply wagon. And when they'd start the war, a regiment would have maybe eight, ten wagons. Well, you got back to where you had four. That'd be headquarters baggage. That'd be the officer's baggage for the regiment. Well, that's one. And another one would have hardtack. Third one would have ammunition. And the fourth one, everything else. So most of the stuff that you needed, as I said, you'd take on your back. And you usually had a hired teamster that would take charge of driving these things. And it's three mules or four horses. And if they didn't turn up, of course, behind your regiment, there was a lot of unhappiness at that point. This is, uh, this is actually the first regiment drawing of it for Harper's, drawn from life, I suppose on the march. And you notice them down there, five across. And you would, of course, have to uh, have the right commands to get everybody out in line of battle in a hurry from that. And that's one of the things that those eternal drills were about, that you do that quickly without stumbling all over your feet and somebody getting lost. And it's not as easy as you might think it is. They said there's a little book about so thick. Uh, like so, uh, the, new, the newbies in the officer ranks would have a little study session with these every night until they got it down. And everybody else would, in a well-managed organization, would get it down too. So you knew how to do it without asking what, what you were doing or questioning why you were doing this. And until it was explained, a lot of people were unhappy with this. They said, well, why am I doing this day after day after day? It seems stupid. But uh, then you'd get the chance to do it when somebody was shooting at you and you'd uh, see fairly quickly what the point of the whole thing was. And you can see some of the, uh, the artillery over on the left Usually they weren't attached to the regiment. They were 
somebody else's battery. A lot of them uh, given a name. So-and-so's battery, Sherman's battery, Ricketts' battery. And when you got done with all the marching, uh, you come to winter quarters or mud quarters. And you'd build up one of these little establishments here and you'd be very unhappy if you were expected to move someplace after you got this thing built if you weren't going to move out entirely. They're dug in just a little bit and whatever you can get for logs or rails are used to build it up a ways. That's the shelter halves on top put on there for, uh, for a roof and you improvise a chimney out of whatever you've got. You can do it with uh, lumber and uh, just put it together with clay very carefully. Uh, this one is quite a confection. It's stones and lumber and a barrel on top. Maybe a little too elaborate for the circumstances as unfortunately we have a little house fire here. And that would be sort of the, the group that hung together would uh, build one of the, these things. You'd have four or six men that would uh, be living together, cooking together, and uh, camping together, and get pretty familiar with each other after a while. That was one of the things that uh, made it very hard to get any new recruits in some of these regiments outside of the policy of the governors of the states, but uh, the regular troop, the troops that had been in there for a year or so, were very reluctant to have some new people come along next to them that maybe didn't know the drill or uh, didn't understand what was going on and might be likely to run. And recruiting uh, operated very slowly. The first regiment started out with about a thousand men and never got, I don't think, any more than uh, two or three recruits that I can make up. And at the end of the war, which for them came in April of 64, when their three years were up, they had about 250 or less. Well, there's 750 men that have gone someplace in the interim. A lot of them sick. Some of them wounded and not back. Uh, one deserter. Uh, some of them what they call discharge for disability. And I think that amounts to just he was totally worn out. So he, a man who couldn't keep up anymore. His feet were sore. He'd uh, been plagued with problems due to bad sanitation and poor food. And uh, he'd pretty much given up on things. Discharge your disability. Now, of course, you did do some fighting. And the way you get into it was with these guys. That's the skirmishers. Now, you go out with those neat ranks marching over the hill. And then somewhere ahead of them, you'd have these guys and they're just going out there uh, to see if anybody that you don't like or is out there and get close enough so they'll shoot at you. That way you can tell it's, it's some of the Confederates are out there. And then you shoot back and if it seems necessary then you turn around and get out of there quick. And that would be actually fairly dangerous duty. Uh, these guys, you can see, are wearing, carrying blanket rolls. Usually when you'd uh, be actually going into battle, you saw that stuff he was carrying, well, you'd dump that. you keep your cartridge box, of course, but all the other stuff, you'd dump it in a pile, or if the wagons were close by, you'd throw it in a wagon. But if you're getting ready for action, you'd, you'd dump that. And hopefully, uh, 
you would carry the field and he would come back and get your stuff. Uh, you might be forced back where your stuff was, in which case you'd be out of luck, I suppose. And the enemy would get your hardtack and whatever happened to be in your uh, knapsack. With the regular formation, the guys that are elbow to elbow, chest to back, are doing. And there's a lineup, two ranks, the sergeant behind them, and the lieutenant over there. Lieutenants uh, should have acted as file closers. You know, if somebody falls over, and he's the one who spotted the gap, then you kind of dress the line over there to cover the hole. Or if you're advancing and somebody turns around and is maybe not keeping up, you jab them a little bit with a sword and give them an incentive to go on. By the way, one thing that you did not do when you uh, were advancing and the guy next to you, your buddy, was shot and dropped, you didn't take time out to carry him back to the aid camp. Let him lie. Don't break ranks. That's another thing the file closer did. Louis shot. So? And the end of that was that a lot of people at the end of a fight would have quite a few wounded and dead laying around. And some of them would lie for quite a while. Sam Bloomer at Antietam was shot in the leg. And uh, the situation was such that uh, the general, General Sumner, had looked at the situation and said, my God, we've got to get out of here. Which was about right. The uh, two New York regiments that were with the first turned and ran. Uh, the first backed out of their firing in good order which is not the easiest maneuver, if you will, and it's something that you should maybe practice a little bit before you try it. But they'd break up a little bit and they'd rally on the flag. One of the reasons why you had a regimental flag, and a lot of them are individual, so you know which regiment it was, and you'd go back to that one. Probably, better done than even the charge at Gettysburg. You'd buy it sitting by yourself out there and backing out and uh, keeping in good order. They took a lot of casualties, but most of them were in the first volley. They had just walked off there. They hadn't had any flankers, and I don't believe any skirmishers. And he just went merrily marching out there uh, apparently somebody thought this was going to be a big walkover and just walked into something. Uh, you know, Sully wrote in his report to the point that we're totally flanked, which means you're standing like this and you have the other regiment is crossways to you. Makes you an awful easy target. Right down the line. And that's the time where you have to, as some of them said, my God, we'll have to get out of here. These things were not always that neat. This is the Battle of Bull Run. Then we have some Confederate cavalry over there, some pieces of Union artillery there, Union group there, more Confederates up the hill, cavalry there, the guys in the funny red uniforms. Those are the Zouaves. And for, for some reason, it was uh, clever to give somebody the uniform that uh, the, uh, I think the irregular troops were the French in Algeria or something like that were. Baggy trousers, red. And uh, instead of, uh, inter and uh, 
red hats and the people that wore those were not society boys or anything or dressing up in a good costume that was the uh, fire zoobs recruited from the New York fire laddies volunteer firemen about as rough a lot as you would uh, care to see when they were camped at uh, before this battle the Minnesotans uh, celebrated the 4th of July by having a nice bonfire and dancing around it and uh, cooking your salt pork or whatever. Uh, the fire zoobs wanted a little more blaze than that, so they went off and found whatever vacant houses were available near at hand and burned them down. Think, well, there's nobody in it, so they must be rebels. Serves them right. And I believe they were one year men, so they got out not long after this. But the uh, Confederates, for some reason, the cavalry took a great dislike to them. And uh, supposedly, as near as I can figure out, one of the Minnesotan Minnesota companies was right next to them. But the, the whole Bull Run thing is uh, rather confused, to say the least. Now there's a wonderful illustration then by Howard Pyle. Isn't that beautiful? And probably something to it, but I suspect in most of these cases with those black powder weapons, you know, you'd have so much gun smoke over the thing that you'd hardly be able to see 10 yards. Some think that's why the uh, first at uh, Gettysburg were successful in getting out of there with a whole skin, or some of them got out anyhow, is that the uh, gunpowder smoke was so thick that the Confederates didn't realize you just had a couple hundred guys coming down after you, and there was really nobody there. As far as they know, it could be the whole Union Army somehow or another come over the hill, so we'd have to find out. This is Nashville, by the way. Here's an interesting quote from uh, not a Minnesotan, but a fellow whose letter I looked at who was at Nashville. And it looked like he uh, had written the thing, what was going on. A little break in the fighting. And after one of these, he wrote back home. Said, well, I was hit by a uh, ball from uh, some canister. Fortunately, it hit my belt buckle. And uh, I was knocked down, and, but uh, survived. And he was talking about going ahead. And he said, oh my God, I would just as soon go forward and meet the rebels as I would to go back where I was. You might wonder when the war actually ended. Well, for the first Minnesota, Sam and Adam, they were both wounded, so that ended in uh, a couple years ahead. But the remainders of the first, the last of them, had uh, been discharged, joined what they called the First Minnesota Battalion, which was sort of a collection of recruits and reenlistments. And they got back here on July the 17th, 1865 and quite a few others who, whose time was up earlier got back about that time. The uh, war officially, I got it here. Now Andy Johnson said it was over on August the 20th. Uh, the Confederate state ship Shenandoah said it was over when they surrendered on November the 6th. Apparently they were at sea someplace and nobody had chosen to tell them about it. Lee, of course, surrendered on April the 9th. Uh, Jefferson Davis was captured on May the 10th. And the last larger Confederate army, Kirby Smith in Texas, 
the word finally got to Texas. You know, it takes a while. And uh, he surrendered on the 26th of May. 1927, the war was almost at an end for these guys. Uh, that's Adam Marty on the left, Peter Hall, John Goff, and the real last man over there on the right. What's the name again? Lockwood? Yeah, Lockwood, good for you. Of course, there's some people that say it ain't over yet. Yeah. Some of them might have a point. Okay. Hey. Thank you very much.